I, there's nothing else to say. Like, <laughs> um, thank you, Matt, for that prayer. Uh, yeah, good, good morning. Uh, it is so good to see you all. It is so good to be with you all this morning. My name is Michael Carlson. For those of you who are newer, I'm the lead pastor here. And to everyone who is here physically with us, welcome. Uh, and, and to those of you viewing online, welcome. Uh, and, and in particular, to those of you who are brand new, um, for whom this is your first time ever at a Sunday morning worship gathering with the Park family, uh, welcome. Uh, if, if it's not been made clear, we here at Park follow Jesus. We believe that life and freedom and hope can all be found in the God who's revealed himself in Jesus. Uh, and our hope is that as we gather, as we sing, as we pray, as we listen, uh, that we would hear from this God. Because uh, we believe he meets us here. Uh, so, thank you for coming. I, uh, before, before we begin with the message this morning, uh, I first want to just introduce some new friends. Um, and I'll begin with just, I'll try to make this brief, but a story. Uh, I believe it was last fall, last winter, there was an uh, older gentleman from New York who, who was uh, a pastor at a Hispanic church who felt God tell him to plant a church in Asbury Park. And so, uh, so he said, okay. And he called the, the one person he knew in Asbury Park, his nephew, whose name is Alvaro, uh, his nephew is a young man who owns his own painting business. He graduated from RBR. Any RBR folks in here? Uh, and Brookdale as well. Um, and, uh, and Alvaro and his wife, Lourdes, began driving every week from Asbury Park to New York to pick up their uncle and back to Asbury Park to start meeting in a living room, to start a church. And, and they did this for months, and as they continued to meet, they began to grow, and people began to get baptized, and it became very clear God was doing something, and they, they began to outgrow this living room. Uh, and, and so they, they discerned, we, we probably need some space to meet as a church. So they started calling churches. And uh, frankly, they were, they were a little discouraged uh, the responses, or lack thereof, from the churches that they were calling. Probably didn't help that it was during a global pandemic. Um, but uh, but we, we were one of the churches that they called, and I was so excited to meet Alvaro, to meet Lourdes. And I remember sitting down earlier this year at an IHOP in Neptune uh, with Alvaro Lourdes, Pastor Eugenio and his wife, um, and just hearing their story. And I was so moved by the fact that God is clearly doing something. And, uh, and I don't know about you, but my, my perspective when it comes to ministry is just to, like, is just to look and see what God is doing and then get in on the fun. Uh, and so, so we started a conversation. And at the time, our building wasn't open, and so we couldn't offer space. Um, but I said, as soon as we reopen, let's talk. And, uh, and let's keep in touch. And so we kept in touch, and I got to hear more of their story. And as soon as we reopened for indoor worship, I reached out to, to Alvaro, and uh, we reengaged the conversation. And, and I'm excited to share that uh, Alvaro and Lourdes and this community uh, has begun meeting at 312 Hansa Avenue in the fellowship space every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. for worship. And they're, they're also meeting uh, twice for midweek Bible studies, Tuesday evenings and Thursday evenings. Um, and I, I'm just so excited about what God is doing. Uh, they, many of them are here this morning. I, don't, I, I promise I won't make you talk, but can you all just raise your hand? Raise your hands. Um, yeah. And... And so the, the purpose, the reason why they're here is there, there are a few reasons. One, I, I wanted to introduce them to us as a church family. 
Um, I also wanted to just, just publicly say what, what is true, which is that uh, because of our shared faith in Jesus, we are family. We are brothers and sisters. Uh, and and we, we want to live into that reality. Um, and, and I also want to say something to us as a church, as Park Church. Um, I have no idea what, what God has in store for, for their faith community, for us, for this new friendship. But I want to challenge, encourage, and invite us as a church to be prayerfully asking God, what are you up to? And how might we, as a church family, uh, serve and, and kindle a friendship with and, and even learn from our brothers and sisters, among whom God is doing something good and beautiful. That's the question I would love us. And I don't have all the answers. I have a million ideas. I don't have all the answers. But that's the prayer I want to encourage us to be praying together. Um, and, and the last thing I want to do is just, uh, Lourdes, Alvaro, if, if you would mind just coming up. Again, I'm not making you talk, but I want to, I want to invite you to come and just stand right here, and I would love to just pray over you too. And I want to invite us as a community to pray over them as they continue in this good work that they are doing. So go ahead and stand right here. Uh, and, and by the way, after the service, if you get a chance, please come and say hello to them. Introduce yourselves. Um, and especially if you speak Spanish, that's a bonus. And I, I know who some of you are. Uh, but, but anyway, I want to invite you. Typically, we would lay hands on people. Um, but there's this thing called COVID. And, and so, so here's what we're going to do. Just hold out your hands toward them. And, uh, and by holding out our hands, it's, it's, it's nothing magical that's happening when we hold out our hands. It's simply a gesture. It's a way of saying we are with you and we are for you. And so let's pray. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you that you love your world. We thank you that through your spirit, you are at work in ways seen and unseen. And we thank you for this new friendship. I thank you for Pastor Eugenio, his wife. I thank you for Alvaro, for Lourdes, for their faithfulness, for their love for you, and for their willingness to respond to your call and, and to to help you build something new. God, we ask that you would protect them, that the enemy would be bound, that you would keep evil and harm far from this community. We pray that you would provide everything that they need to flourish and to bear faithful witness to you in unique ways. Father, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon them in a way that equips them to love and serve each other and their neighbors. We pray that in their community, the good news of your son Jesus would be proclaimed. And for us as a church family, Father, we ask that you would give us wisdom, help us to know as we continue in this friendship how we can best come alongside and serve and learn from our brothers and sisters. Father, we, we love you too. And we thank you for your great love for us and for what you're doing in and around us. And we pray in the name of your son, Jesus, and we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit who is present even here in this room right now. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, once again, uh, please introduce yourselves after the service. Don't, don't pounce on them too hard, but just give them a little bit of space. Um, but yeah, so, so good to have you all. Welcome. Uh, well, as, as many of you know, uh, it is the 4th of July today. Happy 4th of July. Uh, this, this is the day when our country, our nation, the day that we set aside every year and remember the, the Declaration of Independence, something that happened so long ago. Uh, and, and what I find curious is I've been reflecting on, on the 4th of July, um, 
I've been reminded of the fact that, that the, this core value of freedom that is so much tied up in the origin of, of, of our nation as we know it is, has been woven into the entire story of our country. So much of, of our nation's history uh, has been driven by, animated by this idea of freedom and the pursuit of freedom and the failure at times to genuinely embody freedom. And so I think not just of, of what we celebrate on the 4th of July, but I think if, if you go throughout the history of the United States, you can find these, these flashpoint moments in the history of our country where freedom, this idea of freedom and this pursuit of freedom is so central. And so I think of, of not just the Declaration of Independence, but, but I think of the Emancipation Proclamation and, and what, uh, what was celebrated by many even just a, a few weeks ago, um, uh, which is the celebration of Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth, which is a celebration on, on June 19th of every year, uh, and it's something that really I only found out about just a, f- a few years ago, but has become so important to our family, is this time when, that we set aside to, to remember and, and to commemorate the end of institutionalized race-based chattel slavery in the United States. Kind of a, kind of a big deal. And, and, and you, you continue through the history of the United States, and you find these moments, I think, of World War II, and the toppling of a regime bent on pretty much global domination and the role that freedom played in that story. I think of the 1960s and the civil rights movement. Even, even coming up to today, as we very much feel, especially over the course of the past year and a half, so many cultural tensions and so many voices on, on two sides of this polarized place in which we find ourselves. And despite the, the many differences, what we find on both sides is this, really this impulse, this desire for freedom. On both sides. Freedom has been woven through the fabric of, of, our, of our country. And, and, and not just the acquisition of freedom, but the longing for freedom. And, and if we just for a minute take, take our historian hat off, and just let me ask you personally, beyond just surveying history, but even in your own life, I, I imagine that most of us have experienced times in our life when we've felt, where you've felt in some way trapped by something in some way ensnared, in some way bound up, in some way not free to do, not just what you want, but what you feel like you need to do. See, freedom is such a fundamental longing, not just of the collective heart of our culture or our nation, but of every human heart. And it's so basic and it's so fundamental to the human experience, this longing for freedom, that we, we often fail to stop and ask the question, what is freedom? Like, what, what is freedom actually? And, and what if the common way that we tend to think about freedom, what if the kind of freedom that we just assume in our, this cultural moment in which we live actually, more times than not, ends up leading toward captivity? What if the kind of freedom that we often just assume, often instead of leading toward a freer life, leads toward a life where we find ourselves bound up? Uh, This morning, we are beginning a new series called Unchained. Is it a dramatic title? A little bit. But our hope during this series, over these next four and five weeks, is that we explore this question of what is freedom? And that we explore what it means to truly be free in Christ. 
Because we believe that the Bible tells a story. It tells a story of freedom. And that this is a story into which every single one of us are invited. And at the center of this story is the person of Jesus and his invitation to come and to follow him. His invitation to come and to find life, to find the freedom that we all long for in relationship with him. So to begin this series, uh, we are going to look at uh, arguably what is the paradigmatic story of freedom in the Bible, or at least in the Old Testament. We are going to begin with the story of Exodus. We're not going to read the entire book of Exodus. Uh, Exodus is the second book in the Bible. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and it's named Exodus because, if you don't know, it tells the story of the exodus of God's people from slavery in Egypt into freedom. It tells the story of their oppression under the tyranny of Pharaoh out of Egypt into liberty. And, And so what I'd like to do is just share a couple excerpts from the story of the Exodus. And the question I want us to keep in mind is, what is freedom? What is freedom? We're going to begin in chapter 2, uh, verses 23 through 25. And, and at this point in the history of the people of Israel, we find that they have been living in Egypt for over 400 years. And while they did not begin as slaves they uh, became slaves over time. And we come to a point in the story where they are weighed down by oppression. They are anything but free. Pharaoh has a heavy thumb under them. And and in fact, the, the empire of Egypt depended upon their entire economic infrastructure, depended upon the forced labor of the people of Israel. And they are being crushed. And it's, it's right at this point in the story that I want to pick up and read again. Exodus 2, 23 through 25. This is God's word. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. God's word. There are several fascinating things I find about this brief description of what's going on at this point in the story. Just for a sake of clarification, when, when we're told that God heard the groans of his people and then remembered his covenant with Abraham, it's, it's not because he had been suffering from like a, a small bout of amnesia and he had forgotten about that promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, the, the idea of God remembering is a very intentional act on his part to call to mind something that signaled in his heart It is the time now to act. This was a conscious decision. The time has come. But the the most compelling thing, thing, though, I find about this brief description is it tells us something about the heart of God. God is thoroughly anti-slavery. And in every sense of the word, slavery, he is anti Slavery. God did not create a world and fill it with his image bearers only for them to be bound up, only for them to be chained up, only for them to be in some way tied up. God's vision of flourishing life for his people and for his world is one marked by freedom. God looks and he sees that his people are enslaved and it breaks his heart. This is what God is like. And so, 
If you know the story of the Exodus, you know that what happens from here is basically a pretty dramatic and drawn out narrative about how God rescues his people from slavery in Egypt. And again, we don't have time to read the whole story, but it's wild. The things that happen, he raises up this guy named Moses who has his own incredible story. And then he uses Moses to to lead his people out. There are 10 plagues that wreak havoc in Egypt. Things get nuts, right? And then finally, the people leave Egypt, right? And then the king, Pharaoh, changes his mind and is like, actually, I don't want you guys to leave. He sends his army after them. And then God is like, guys, relax. I'm going to take care of you. And that's when the Red Sea parts, the people of Israel go through. Safe and sound, the army chases after them, they run, and then the water comes back together and God saves the day his people are free. It's this incredible story of rescue, this incredible story of a people having been enslaved who are now brought into freedom. And what I find very interesting about this story is the response of the people of Israel right after they're freed. Clearly, they, I'm sure, they imagined, they dreamt about what it would be like to be free. As they're serving, as they're getting whipped, as they're being horribly mistreated, as they are being crushed by the weight of Egyptian oppression, I'm sure they dreamt about freedom quite a bit. Finally, then, they are set free. They're let loose And what is their response? They grumble. And it's it's funny, the word grumble is used several times. We're told in Exodus chapter 15, the people grumbled against Moses. Chapter 16, the whole community grumbled against Moses. Chapter 17, they grumbled against Moses. Clearly, Clearly, whatever idea they had about what freedom was, was different than God's idea. They had their own ideas about what freedom must look like. And it turns out it wasn't exactly the idea of freedom that God had in mind. And I can't help but wonder if we all too often are like Israel in this way. We have our own ideas of what freedom is. Uh, there's, there's this great TED Talk. Anyone familiar with TED Talks? There's, there's this great TED Talk by this guy named Barry Schwartz who wrote this book called The, the Paradox of Choice. And he's a professor, uh, and you can Google it, Paradox of Choice, TED Talk. And, and basically in this book and in this presentation, what he argues is that It's just a given in our culture, in our American culture, we assume that freedom means more options. And the more options we have, the more free we are. And the whole point of his talk is, actually, that's not true. The more options we have, oftentimes, the less free we become. Now, now he says, you know, the solution isn't no options, right? But but his whole point is that he, he names and exposes what he calls the official dogma in our society. And and this is how he defines the official dogma. This is what everyone, he says, believes. He says, the way to maximize freedom is to maximize choice. The more choices people have, the more freedom they have. And the more freedom they have, the more welfare they have. And then he says, this, I think, is so deeply embedded in the water supply that it wouldn't occur to anyone to question it. This fundamental idea of freedom being wrapped up in my ability to choose from, to do whatever I want. And the more options I have, the more freedom I have. And then he gives all of these examples of how this basic idea of freedom is is just woven into everyday life for us. He's like, you go to the grocery store. How How many salad dressing options are on the shelf? Like over 100, right? I mean, that's enough to cause paralysis, right? We have so many options like, oh, man, I, I love Caesar, but if I get that, what about that balsamic over here? And, and so he says, and it's, it's not just that. He's like, when you go to the doctor, he says, when I was young and I went to the doctor, I would tell the doctor what I wanted, what, what was wrong, 
He would give me the diagnosis, and then he'd say, and this is what you need to do. He's like, nowadays, I go to the doctor, and I tell him what's wrong. He gives me his diagnosis, and he says, here are your three options. Which would you like to do? And he says, well, I, you know, you're, you're the doctor. Like, what do you think I should do? And the doctor says, well, here are your three options. What would you like to do? Like, I, actually, personally, I just experienced this like four or five months ago. Esther was, uh, had the sniffles. And so, of course, overreactive parents we were like, she has COVID. What is going on? So we're like, we've got to, we've got to get her checked. So we, uh, but we know if she gets a test, that means she has to miss some school. And it's like, is it worth it? Do we just kind of be like, oh, you're fine? And so, you know, that whole thing. So we took her to the doctor. And the pediatrician, you know, he looked at her, did all that stuff. And then, uh, and then it came to the question of, should she get a test or not? And so I was like, so what do you think? Like, do you think we should test her? He's like, well, you know, do, do you want to? <laughs> like, that wasn't my question. <laughs> like, do you, should we get her tested? He's like, well, you know, here are the facts. You know, you could get her tested. You could do this. What do you want to do? I'm like, no, you're not hearing me. <laughs> I don't want the burden of choice right now. See, but this is, this is the cultural moment in which we find ourselves. I mean, think of just, just another example this guy gives, prescription drugs. There is so much money spent on marketing prescription drugs to you and to me, which is funny given that we can't buy it, right? The reason why is because the pharmaceutical companies expect you to see the ad, go to your doctor, and to say, hey, this is what I want, right? Because we live in a culture that fundamentally understands freedom to be about me getting to do whatever I want. And the more choices I have, the more freedom I have. Freedom is a matter of going wherever I want. But, but here's the problem, though with this version of freedom. If freedom is basically doing whatever I want, having the freedom to do whatever I want, go wherever I want, why is it that so often when we do have the freedom to do whatever we want, we end up captive? We end up bound up. We end up doing things that actually does not produce a life of freedom and joy and peace and love, but, but actually ends up creating a sort of prison for ourselves. I think of like a, a buddy of mine in college. You know, the, the thing about graduating from high school and going to college is like this is a story of freedom, right? You're, 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 you live in this oppressive household with your parents, all these rules, and then you go to college, hello, freedom. And, uh, and I, I had a buddy who, who ver this was very much his experience, and he went to college in my dorm, and he had all this freedom he had never had before. And he discovered, I can literally play World of Warcraft all day, every day. Because he didn't have parents reminding him he has to go to school, he has to do his homework. So that's what he did, because he had freedom. And then he had to drop out of college <laughs> because he stopped going to class, right? And, and, and we do this when we operate from this understanding of freedom being really it's about me and me doing whatever it is that I want, then the things that we choose can very quickly make us their servants. They can very quickly begin to exert control over our lives, and we find ourselves in prison. We find ourselves tied up, and we, we do this with, with food. We do this with our devices. We do this with unhealthy patterns of thinking. We do this with our relationships. We do this with our money. If we think freedom uh, is simply a matter of multiplicity of choice, of me deciding what path I'm going to go. Ultimately, it will not lead to freedom, but to captivity. See, but in the Exodus story, what we find is that God has a different understanding of freedom. 
It's different than ours, and it was different than Israel's. It's interesting. The moment the people of Israel left Egypt, do you know what happened? Like, the second they left, we might think that God would have been like, okay, everyone, you're, you're out here, you're free, have at it. There's a big desert here, there's a promised land somewhere far that, like, just go for it. Have fun. Do whatever you want. That's not exactly what happened. And so, so we pick it up in, uh, in verse uh, chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. This is what happened the moment the people of Israel found themselves free from, uh, from Egyptian oppression. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So, so here are these people. They just came out of slavery in Egypt. And what does God do? In a rather dramatic fashion, he, he appears to them and is like, okay, you want to know what freedom is? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me during the day. Follow me during the night. Don't try to go your own way. It's not going to work out. Follow me. And for the whole rest of the Old Testament story, what we see is this struggle of the people of Israel time and time again going their own way instead of going God's way. And so God sends them prophet after prophet after prophet speaking to his people, saying, listen, if you keep going that way, you're going to find yourselves enslaved again. If you keep going that way, you're going to find yourself serving once again gods that are not as gracious and compassionate and loving as I am. Trust me. And he kept speaking to them time and time again. And they kept going away time and time again until God finally said, okay, I'm going to speak one more word. I'm going to say one more thing, and I want you to really listen carefully this time. And so God then spoke, and his word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, in the person of Jesus, what we find is everything that God wants to say to us in a person. And when we look at Jesus, what we find is this walking, talking embodiment of freedom. You just read the story of Jesus. It's like everyone who came to him with this posture of faith found themselves set free by something. Some people were set free from demonic possession. Some people came to him blind or had other physical ailments. They came and just being close to him set them free. Some people were weighed down by shame and guilt because of mistakes. And then they met Jesus and experienced a forgiveness they never thought possible. Some people have been weighed down, were oppressed by a a toxic and unhealthy religious culture. And Jesus came and presented this vision of God and his kingdom that was breathtaking and compelling and driven by love. And people found themselves freed. Everywhere Jesus went, he embodied freedom. The freedom that we long for, the freedom we know we were created for. And and everything he taught aimed in this direction as well. Jesus came and, and he said, listen, if whoever loses their life, will find it. Don't don't try to find your life. Don't try to grasp for a life of freedom because you won't find it. You'll lose it. But whoever loses their life, gives their life for my sake, clings to me, they'll find it. And then in the moment in Jesus' life that perhaps captures freedom better than any other, we find him in a garden praying. And he did in that garden what he did his whole life. He didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't want to die. And yet, what he said was, God, 
It's not what I want that matters, it's what you want. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And he did what he had been doing his whole life, following his father. He went to the cross and he died for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. He was raised from the dead, defeating death itself, and he now is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is speaking, even this morning, and he is saying, follow me. Don't go your own way. Trust me. Trust my voice. This is how you will find freedom. And so I want to end very simply this morning with a question. And this is a question for everyone. And I imagine your answer to this question will be different than the person sitting next to you. But it's this. What do you need to be freed from? What is it in your life today, this week, that you need freedom from? Maybe it's an unhealthy pattern of thinking. Maybe it's addiction to a device or something else. Maybe it's loneliness and you feel imprisoned in isolation. What is it that you need to be freed from? That's the question. And the invitation this morning is to explore what it might look like to respond to Jesus' invitation to follow him to not go your own way, but to follow him. Pray with me. Father, uh, we pause now and we thank you that you are a God, a God who, who wants freedom for his world, who wants freedom for all of us. Uh, we ask, especially as we continue through this series, that, uh, that you would expose those things in our lives that, that make freedom seem like something distant, something intangible. And Father, we ask that you, would, that you would meet us, that you would be at work in our hearts and in our minds and, and help us to understand how following your son Jesus, how encountering your grace and your forgiveness and the hope that we can have in him is the way to freedom. Uh, we thank you for who you are, the God who gives freedom, the God who sets us free. Uh, and we pray, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, and we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.